as Chris introduced, my current job is working advising um, companies, mostly mostly American companies, but some foreign companies on situation in in Asia. It can be very specific work, problem solving regarding a um, a particular market problem, um, looking for partners, trying to find solutions to regulatory issues and the like, or it can be broader uh, advisory work in, in identifying general market trends and political situations. The, um, uh, our firm is comprised of, uh, the senior people are all former government um, folk with a variety of experiences in different agencies and, and different countries of East Asia. The, um, uh, and I want to say at the outset, um, a shout out to uh, the Heinrich Foundation, which is um, I'm working with, um, associated with, and, and that they've been sponsoring these kind of activities in the past. Last year's uh, opportunity uh, in Hong Kong to meet with a similar group, um, also organized by the National Press Foundation, was focused very much on the US-China situation. And this year now we're, we're talking about a, a different problem set um, as it impacts both global trade, but also I think beyond trade uh, to other aspects of the, of, the, of the global economy. What you'll hear me say is uh, a variety of, of information that points to um, three trends, which I think are happening in succession um, and perhaps even simultaneously, but, but, uh, but which should all be um, identified as, as important ones in, in people's reporting and understanding of what's happening. Uh, the first is decoupling, that, that conversation around the increasing distance between the US economy and the Chinese economy in particular, driven largely by geostrategic considerations, uh, changes in, in how those countries are uh, viewing one another and, uh, and the policies that they see as most appropriate for their economic engagement, um, given the, the overall competitive atmosphere between the United States and China. And the United States and China, of course, is a proxy for a lot of other um, uh, uh, tense relationships in the world. Um, not the US-China one isn't the only one, but it, but it is the, was the principal driver, and I think will continue to be the principal driver of that theme of decoupling meaning what should happen to an increasingly globalized world um, in a situation where globalization has reached the point where some of the inter economic interaction between major economies is, can be defined in areas that, are, that those countries from a, from a security perspective find uncomfortable. Um, the second, of course, is globalization. Even as we confront the decoupling issue, the, the whole question around increasing trade friction, um, what people have labeled as protectionism, but which is really actually populism in, in uh, d major democracies, the process of globalization has continued to pace. Um, emerging economies continued to grow in ways that really brought them tighter into the, into the uh, embrace of other economies. Increased interdependence continues to happen. And, it, and some of those deals and, and trends that are, that are now appear to be completely on hiatus um, are, are happening even now. But along with globalization, there can be deglobalization. And what uh, certainly we will experience over the course of 2020 as the defining characteristic of, the, of this year is deglobalization, um, decreasing amounts of trade um, cross-border investment, a distancing of economies, reflecting the fact that human beings, because of the, of the virus, are, are not associating with one another as much. And so that will be reflected in economic activity across borders or even within borders for complex places like uh, the United States or China. The question then becomes, uh, and the interesting one for next year or the latter half of this year, will be what will be the process of re-globalization against the backdrop of decoupling, against the backdrop of the, the coronavirus. And the, the instinct, the, the gut feeling of the people at my firm and myself is that that re-globalization process will happen uh, starting in Asia um, and spreading outward just as the virus did. 
Uh, and the question is then, what is the role of the United States going to be in that? Um, that's a, an important question for, for Americans. I realize not everyone on, on this call is American. So let me walk you through three things then, thinking about the impact of the, of the virus. Well, that, you know, overly broad perhaps background, uh, but uh, the food for thought that I think we all need to be thinking about. Paths of transmission. Now, when you've all been talking primarily about trade and the traditional paths for transmission of, of uh, an economic event from one economy to the next through the trade channel is sect sectoral based supply chain disruptions or, or rejoinings uh, or uh, an overall change in external demand that then has a, uh, reshapes the trade direction. And both are happening now. So initially in the coronavirus case, people were focused primarily on what are the things that we're not gonna get from China that are necessary in order to put together um, the pieces, the supply chain question. Um, and that was a complex and still is a complex question. There are entire factories in Japan which have been shut down or can't produce their final goods because of inputs that, that are not reaching them from China because the factories in China are closed. There are, some, there's, are similar instances in the United States and other economies, although to a lesser degree than in the economies that are more closely intertwined with China in that supply chain question, primarily the ASEAN countries, um, Japan, and especially um, the Republic of Korea. The, um, but this has all been very sector specific and even product specific. You can have, even within the automotive sector, for example, you can have one car that can't be made because there's no parts and another car they can be made. And so people switch out the lines or try and adjust to that fact. But it is the fact of the matter, you know, you take, take automobiles, for example, um, in order to complete a vehicle, you gotta have all the parts. You can't ship a vehicle missing headlights, right? No one's gonna buy it or uh, with no steering wheel. And you might have 9,999 9 of the 10,000 parts in an automobile, but if you don't have that last part, you can't ship it. So the supply chain disruptions um, become have a have an exponential effect the more complex the product is, and that's something that we were seeing already, um, which has had a, a big impact on China's immediate neighbors um, in, in terms of, for example, first quarter performance, where Japan, um, which hoped initially to be in in a in a position of a, a rebound from the inevitable downturn that they expected after raising the consumption tax on October 1st, that just hasn't happened. And that probably won't happen in the, in the second quarter as well. Uh, and Japan may, may experience three or perhaps four quarters of year on year um, downward, downward growth um, uh, in, in starting from October 1st. So that's channel number one. Channel number two is external demand. And as economies grow more slowly, then they're not going to buy stuff from one another and the shipment numbers will come down the first first there, and the one question is how much inventory has there been now the fact that the supply chains um, have been disruptive of course has created a situation where um, companies and distributors might have insufficient inventory but then uh, the demand question as the demand falls off I mean it works in the opposite direction but they, they both end up leading to the same net result, which is less economic activity. Um, the question is the transmission channel. So you can actually have supply chain shocks that are being masked by the fact that there's no demand for the goods. Or a, a demand side um, a phenomenon, an inc a decrease in consumption, which may be attributed to a supply chain disruption, but is in fact the result uh, of um, of just general no one going out and 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 um, uh, and consuming those goods. So that's the those are the base. That's trade, and that's how it works. And it's, it's quite simple. It's this, this isn't the case where uh, the you know the exogenous factor. And I'll do a little bit of comparison to other shocks in a minute. The exogenous factor, unlike 9/11, where it was ships and planes not traveling or finding it more difficult to get around, um, along with, with a, a sense of, of, of diminished expectations for consumption and investment. 
but rather uh, it's it's the people aren't moving. So it's gonna it's gonna play itself out in a different way uh, than than 9/11 did, but it, but it will have some similar characteristics uh, in terms of the severity and the steepness of the shock. So that's trade. Now the fact of the matter is, unfortunately, the piece in other sectors of the economy um, are is actually more severe than the trade impact. So although you all are focused on trade today, let me talk about two other things, which is services sector uh, and, and financial and macroeconomic um, transmission of, of, um, of negative uh, economic news. The services piece is particularly important. Um, uh, the, you, you, if you go back through the statistics over the last 20 years, there's been a certain growth in trade globally over, over those years. And the, you know, everyone tracks that and it's been robust, right? Trade has grown faster than GDP um, and services trade, when that's counted in, now often people focus on trading goods more than trade and services, but services trade has expanded even faster than, than goods trade. What's happening now is services trade is contracting faster than goods trade, again, because of the, the, the social distancing taking place between people and that's gonna be extraordinarily severe. So it's not just tourism and travel, um, but at all other services, people aren't gonna go out and get, and get haircuts. People aren't gonna um, you know, go to the doctor as much or, or, or take, take advantage of other services that are available. The, there's some things which of course will happen. Everyone will, the tax accountants will, won't experience a problem because everyone's gotta meet the deadline and they'll pay their taxes. I just did and it was very painful. Um, but the, the, um, that situation uh, in services is going to be extraordinarily severe. And uh, we'll, we'll see the most bankruptcies in, and downturns you know, specific, in specific services-related sectors. And that's, that's tough because in, more and more, those have become internationally provided goods. Um, and, and in particular the ownership, even if the goods or uh, the services are provided locally, the ownership can be international in nature, like web-based services, for example, or um, distribution can be um, internationally owned. And so you get, that brings us then to the other one, the most dangerous type of cross-border economic bad news transmission, which is in the financial sector. And it's most dangerous because when, the and when financial sectors tighten up and contract and the channels don't move, then everything else shuts down. Um, and, and you can get a, into a situation where lots and lots of people uh, have a hole in their, in their personal finances or companies have a hole in their corporate finances and then it takes more time to dig out of those holes because they're not credit worthy, they have trouble getting credit, you get a credit contraction, you all know this. Um, you know, a general macroeconomic contraction fed by a financial um, constriction is going to be more severe than, than a demand shock um, that's, that's exogenous uh, in nature and more lasting just because of the nature of it. So in terms of what's happened on that so far, not as much so far, right? I, you know, I think most of the epidemiolo epidemiological type people are forecasting that that for the United States the peak could be you know could peak in April and be done in in May, um, or it could peak in in May and June and not be done until July or August. And those will be very different results um, in terms of the impact, both the so the number of people that are not doing normal economic activity and how long it goes on will will impact the degree of financial constriction. That takes place. That final, you know, I'm giving you economics 101, but I think it's important to review that financial constriction will be, um, you know, we don't know yet how bad it's going to be, but the early signs are that the Federal Reserve and others are expecting it to be rather severe. Um, that's why, when despite the fact that the Fed did, uh, um, it's not unprecedented, but it's been uh, 12 years since the last time this was deployed, a full interest one percentage point uh, in interest rate cut by the Fed um, uh, on a Sunday 
trying to stabilize and send positive market signals because of what they were reading and hearing in the tea leaves of, of global finance uh, actually ended up resulting in a downturn in markets that the U.S. is experiencing today uh, and, and overnight in, in, um, uh, in Asian markets, a general uh, sell-off. Not as severe as, as the early part of last week, but still an expression that, well, okay, we get it that all the central banks are going to be putting pedal to the metal to try and keep um, financing as cheap as possible from the government side and lots of government guarantees being put into place. But we're still not convinced as markets that that's going to be sufficient to get through this shock. That, that is a, a, a real problem. Um, what we expect to see is uh, all of the governments of, of the world, frankly, but particularly Asia, Europe, and the United States, looking very, very closely and very quickly at some extraordinary fiscal measures, government spending to match the monetary policy outlays of the, of the, of the central banks. Central banks can act quickly, but the results tend to be slow as they work their way through the economy. Uh, governments have trouble act, acting quickly, particularly democracies, um, but the results can, can be felt faster depending upon the design of the fiscal measures. So that, again, all very familiar, but that's going to be the conversation. And all of this is interrelated, the trade piece, the services trade, uh, and the financial and macroeconomic piece going forward. So, you know, again, to review, how does this feel compared to other shocks uh, that have taken place in the past? And we've got some examples to draw from, unfortunately, in, in, in the last 30 years between the Asian financial crisis, the, then we had, after that, I'm doing chronologically, you've got SARS, and then you got 9-11, and then you got the global um, financial crisis, all had different impacts. And uh, that's the chronology, the, the, the spark of the problem in each case was different um, in terms of location, in terms of its nature and its volume. But um, to review, uh, they've had differential impacts in terms of how long the problem has lasted um, and, and how deep the problem went. The, the, starting with the Asian financial crisis, it started with developing economies um, being over leveraged uh, and that spreading to Japan, uh, to Korea, and then to much of the emerging market world. Um, but the, the China and the United States, biggest economies in Europe were able to kind of ride it out um, and, and compensate for those changes. And, and, and it all kind of went, went by in uh, a year or two, but it was financial in nature. So again, you had the, the a sharp downtrend and a, and a slow trajectory of recovery, particularly in the countries that experienced the direct impact of it. Um, SARS was a blip, right? Very severe impact on China. Most of the infections were in China and a, and a couple other countries, a big and sharp and short-lived impact on travel and tourism, uh, and, and a V-shaped recovery, boom, boom, back up business in, in no time. Uh, and that is, would be the best case scenario for uh, the, the coronavirus situation. 9-11, um, uh, had huge impacts on, on geopolitics and war making and, and the US policy towards the Middle East and yada, yada, yada. Uh, on the economic side, again, it was like SARS, down and back pretty quickly. Um, US a little slower than, than others because of the, the impact on consumer sentiment, but it was primarily a services sector impact through an exogenous shock. Uh, on, on travel um, and, and tourism had a big impact on a certain set of companies, but nothing uh, systemic in nature or lasting. And then the most, the one that we want to avoid is the 2008 scenario, um, the global financial crisis where things really went down. They, it started in the world's largest economy. Um, it started and it was financial in nature rather than physical in nature. And that financial nature aspect to it made it 
by, by its own characteristics, harder to get out of. And you had that very flat, gradual recovery uh, in the United States that took, took the better part of half of a decade to, to get back um, to where things um, would, have, would have been. So looking at that range of possibilities for the current downturn, um, one can hope that it would be SARS, but it's already bigger than SARS. And, it's, and the Chinese economy was bigger when it started. And even if it had only been just a China thing, it would have been um, bigger than SARS. But the, but the disease has spread well beyond China um, and looks like it'll have similarly large blossomings um, throughout other countries of the, of the world. Um, happening not simultaneously, but in succession, perhaps. Uh, and that creates a bigger problem um, in terms of how it feeds through uh, the, the, the world system. The, uh, so that would be too optimistic. Um, whether this becomes like the global financial crisis, and the Fed is, is looking you know, through its behavior, pushing interest rates to zero in a precipitous manner, would seem to indicate that its calculation is that this could be as big as the as the global financial crisis in terms of the amount of constricted activity, but will it last as long? And that's really the, the, the key question that we don't know at this point, because we don't know how, how successful the major economies will be in the, in the social distancing aspect in order to try and bring um, things uh, to a, a close as, as quickly as possible, how quick the vaccine comes online, the treatment cases, um, uh, and does it, is there a second wave? Like does China have a second wave of, of coronavirus in the fall or does the fa its success um, this, this winter, spring mean that it doesn't, doesn't come back there and they're positioned to keep it out? So don't know um, is the short answer to that, but I think it's useful to benchmark. And the last thing I'll do, and then we should go to questions and conversation is think about it country by country. Yeah. In, in Asia. Um, and very briefly, um, just looking at the starting points of the economies uh, and their political capabilities to deliver the kind of policy that's needed. Um, one could look just looking at some of the major markets. Uh, China, it, you know, its starting point, although slower, was still strong, um, growing at, at whatever China is actually growing at somewhere between 4% and 6% on, on the last few years. Um, one could expect that to bounce back um, and one could expect the Chinese government to be fairly quick footed in its response, um, both in terms of monetary policy and fiscal policy to try and bring things back online. So that's probably the brightest spot in Asia and it's also the largest economy. The one thing that constrains China, of course, is its bad debt overload. Um, and its desire to not let lots of inefficient state-owned enterprises completely off the hook um, for, their, for their lack of profitability. Um, but, but certainly China will take what measures it needs in the short term in order to try and prevent um, something more systemic, creating even more bad debt and, and, and overload. And China is, is kind of invested out in terms of hard infrastructure investment. And you've seen that in their policies and their smart ones to, in, in Wuhan in particular, emphasize getting money out to small businesses, the ones that have been most damaged by the downturn um, due to the coronavirus, and try and keep as many of those businesses alive as possible, which makes good sense. And, and you would expect that to be um, um, a relative bright spot going forward. Japan's the next biggest economy um, in the region, and it's got, it was doing about as badly as Japan ever does. Um, no better, no worse uh, leading into the situation. Um, it it uh, has some depth in terms of its fiscal capability. It, it, it doesn't have as much depth in terms of its monetary policy capability. One could expect its decision making to be fairly good fairly rapid, that although there's going to be an instability surrounding the whole question of the Olympics, the whole question of the prime ministerial succession, um, there, regardless of all that, there is a ruling party which is firmly in charge of the country and can be expected to make policy happen. 
Um, India is a bit of a question mark, frankly. Um, the economy was already in a downturn and whether it has the, the wherewithal to, to keep, uh, to have the government really play an active role in, in uh, getting resources to the, the private sector or not, I think it bears close, close watching. Um, Korea is one to be, pay very particularly close attention to, I, I would think. Their, their economy was in, in, in relatively difficult condition. Um, they are disproportionately impacted by the supply chain shocks that I was describing, um, disproportionately affected by the external demand shocks, and their governance situation is, is, is not um, entirely stable. Um, so one could see some difficulty in enacting the kind of measures, although Bank of Korea was very quick and, and acted yesterday, um, one could see some real problems there. Uh, and it's worth focusing on that as a, as a, as a, as a tough point. Um, and then I'll just mention, because I used to live there until the last summer, um, Hong Kong is in a, is in a pass of trouble. Um, the economically, it, it's, it's one of the most, um, uh, external shock, vulnerable economies uh, in the region. Uh, and um, politically, it's in a state of, of uh, near um, paralysis, except for the parts that, that look after and mind the key questions of the economy around the, the Hong Kong's participation in the global financial markets um, and, and its ability to back those up with using uh, its its fiscal reserves. So I would expect that you will see in Hong Kong um, three things. One is continued, the financial markets will continue to reflect global trends, not local trends. The local economy will, will look extraordinarily bad throughout 2020. Uh, and there'll be more political instability um, uh, in, the, in the coming year, um, which is all kind of sad. So, I think that's probably enough to get started. Maybe we should go to some questions and, and, and comments and criticisms. I'm sure there's some of those too. Uh, and sure, we'll thanks for that great Thank overview. Um, one, of the, one of the first questions deals with what you were just talking about. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on, the, on China and Hong Kong. Will the coronavirus impact the relationship between China and Hong Kong and change the dynamic that led to last year's protests? I mean, does the, inter, does the interjection of the virus into this already tense relationship, I mean, what, what, will, it mean, what will that mean about Chinese control over, over Hong Kong and the limits they're trying to put on it? That's an interesting question. It's a little bit, spec, uh, the answer would be a bit speculative in nature, but the, the virus has um, impacted both the Chinese economy and the Hong Kong economy negatively. Um, it has slowed down the process of integration of the Hong Kong and mainland economies. Um, it has um, uh, created um, at the emotional and personal and political level, um, perhaps even greater distrust um, between those in Hong Kong who are distrustful, already distrustful of China uh, and China, um, and, and even more distance in public opinion between those who are more accommodative towards uh, the mainland and, and, and those who are more distrustful. Um, the Hong Kong government has actually done a very credible job, at least appears from the numbers, and it looks like this is true, um, in containing uh, the coronavirus infections. It's getting zero credit for that because the trust level towards the government was low to start with. So I think the net result of that is continued bad feeling, um, a sense of some people, and there will be people in Hong Kong come summertime saying, look, see, China did a good job of containing this virus. Maybe the virus came from China, but they did a good job responding to it. Look, the West is having a problem um, dealing with it. Maybe we should give, give cut China some slack. Um, and people whose mind are already made up to be anti-China saying, uh, well, no, China has created this virus. Um, the fact that we're part of China is one of the reasons why we got hit by it and, and we're continuing to experience no, to no tourism and no, no visitations from China and, and it's, it's their fault. So really I think the, the, 
the net impact could be greater um, polarization of, of public opinion um, within Hong Kong, even though there will be people hoping that the opposite is true. Um, I don't think it'll necessarily impact the mainland's um, uh, policy towards Hong Kong um, beyond the fact that the one thing that it perhaps might happen is mainland, you know, mainland government's pretty busy and it's going to have a lot going on. And I don't think it'll be um, looking to do anything interesting or precipitous, either positively or negatively in its, in its book and its policy towards Hong Kong. I'm probably trying to set that aside, relatively speaking. And that, so that um, uh, puts the, the city in the driver's seat uh, and whether it, you know, in my gut instinct, it's going to be another hot summer with a lot of protests, but whether that, that's where the population goes or not, it's not entirely predictable. Um, and, uh, and it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily driven by um, calm thought about self-interest, but rather just what feels right to people. Okay, so dealing with the trust issue also, how trustworthy are the numbers we are getting from China, both on coronavirus and on economic output? I think the numbers on coronavirus are probably being reported um, faithfully, depending upon the quality of the information. So the, the numbers, I think the numbers in China about coronavirus cases are probably better than the numbers in the United States. The reason for that being that they've been at it longer and there's more testing going on um, and more control measures in place and, and contact tracing and the like. Uh, that And the numbers in the US are, are just because there's an insufficient testing taking place. So the the I don't think that either um, nation or government or any of the governments of the world really frankly have a self-interest in lying about the numbers of coronavirus cases. I would guess that the economic numbers are about as as off as they always are. Um, mm -hmm. And you know you, they're they're useful as an indicator of direction, but I wouldn't bet too much money based on exact gradations in in those numbers. And sort of there are people who start with the assumption six percent growth number means six percent. People would say, well, that, that means, you know, whatever it really is, and then look at the direction of it. I, I kind of fall in that camp. You, you, the, China has a good incentive to accurately report the direction of the economy, but maybe not the exact figures. Okay. So we got a question from International Trade Today. Are the top manufacturers of ventilators in China, are the top manufacturers of ventilators in China? Um, is there a capacity for ramp up of that? And will the trade war with China mean any additional machines will go to Europe, not the US? Um, I don't know um, where, sorry, I'm not a, an expert on the ventilator manufacturing market and where they take place. My guess is that, is that there would not be any, um, I would be very surprised if China intentionally put a ban on, on uh, any particular foreign market for um, ventilators, that would be an um, extraordinarily uh, incendiary thing to do. Okay. So, um, okay, here we got a question. The first shipment of masks and coronavirus test kits to the U.S. is taking off from Shanghai. Should President Trump start showing China some love? I'm not exactly sure where we should go with that, but uh, if, if we are getting these critical supplies from China, mm -hmm. should that should that indicate a, a, a thawing? Uh, whoever uses the masks should probably say, that's great and thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, at the same time, the U.S. is shipping food to China. So, you know, trade is good, right? Um, everyone should say thank you every day just as out, of, out of, you know, namaste kind of philosophy of life. The, the president is always all over the map on China um, in terms of, going back and forth between trying to maintain good, a, a good footing and being critical. So I expect him to continue to, to um, bounce around on that. Okay. So um, can you talk about the impact on demand for food and meats and grains to feed livestock, corn, you know, corn and soybeans? Demand where? I guess we're talking about demand Demand in, I'm, I'm, I'm presuming demand in China from U.S. 
U.S. farm producers? Do we know if there's going to be an impact on that? Well, the the um, agricultural trade tends to be fairly steady, right? Um, now, China lost a large number of pigs um, to the African swine flu, and uh, and so that would have suppressed demand somewhat for for corn and other inputs into the pork industry. Um, but aside from that, um, there's a, there's a certain math to um, the whole livestock industry and, and livestock need to eat a certain amount in order to make the meat that we all, that people eat. So um, what the, the main thing that happened in, because of the, the US China trade friction was a disruption in where China was getting its agricultural inputs. And those had an impact on prices and also on, on, on routes. So the, um, much of that's now been reestablished because of the, the agreement that was reached between the US and China um, in January. And so I would expect that, that there, you know, those shipments will happen. There's also no good reason for, um, you know, agricultural goods not to be shipped at, um, because of the virus. The, 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 that's, not, that's not a transmission route for the virus. So a ship carrying a bunch of grain can, is perfectly safe. Okay. Um, related food question. Uh, could Chinese authorities ramp up imports of meat and other food products um, in order to lower prices of food for its own consumers as a gesture of goodwill? Sure. Why not? Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> if it chose to do so, or if it just wanted to make people happy. You know, Chinese people kind of missed Chinese New Year's this year, which is a big uh, um, festival of, cons of you know, consumption. So they, uh, maybe there'll be, who knows, you know, I, if China wanted to, they could declare that like some week in July is a big holiday and everyone should eat a lot. And that would yeah. be good demand. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, on the, on the coronavirus numbers from China, you know, the, the charts that I've seen of showing just a, you know, a, a leveling off of them and, and I've seen headlines about that they reached their peak a while ago. What do you make of those numbers? And do you think it's a true peak or will it possibly jump up again later on? Well, the latter part of that's harder. I think the, the, um, the numbers, there isn't really any good reason to, to doubt that they're accurate as far as the information that, that is being gathered. And China, having started earlier and doing this intensively for a long time, um, is, is tracking things extraordinarily closely and does have, is doing lots and lots of testing. So the, 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 and, uh, the, the shape of the Chinese um, epidemic was the kind of shape that epidemiologists are familiar with, or at least they say that, right? That it went up and then it starts to, to level off and then, and then the number of new cases um, starts to decline and the recovered people catch up and then the number of existing cases go down. Uh, meanwhile, there's been a whole ramp up in the provision of medical care. Um, so the, the, there's, you know, you end up in a situation where you have plenty of capacity to deal with the, the infections and then things go down further. This, the question about a, a second rebound is a, is a very good one. And, and so there's going to be a strong incentive for uh, for, for China to continue to be very, very, um, excuse me, let me just say no to this. The, um, to be, uh, tough on inward travel, on travel within China and, and track closely, uh, what's going on at the same time as trying to ramp up the economy. So, um, you know, there is a possibility of, of resurgence in China, certainly, and 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 I I'm not capable of predicting whether that's going to happen or not. Okay, so you talked. Um, we have a question related to uh, decoupling, um, related to your globalization deglobalization reflection. Do you see coronavirus accelerating U.S. China decoupling? Yes, it already did um, accelerate that, and um, both in terms of of lack of of travel, lack of contact, um, meaning deals that were foregone, and also a little bit of sense of, of what some of the other questions were kind of driving at, 
perhaps obliquely, uh, is the the whole question about about trust um, at the government level, which is at a very low ebb, and and does also impact then the policy measures which are being taken place in the sense of competitiveness. Um, so the the fact that the virus started in China certainly led to uh, even more fuel for the whole decoupling phenomenon. Um, not as much as some other things, but 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 um, and and it's certainly not the only source of of, of distrust. But do you, listening to the rhetoric in the United States and 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 then the counter rhetoric, or I don't know which one's counter to which, but you know this is ludicrous storytelling within China that the virus actually started in the United States and that kind of thing um, is a sign of the the under underlying phenomenons being being um, even strengthened by the virus, the, the, the decoupling, the, the factors driving decoupling. Okay. So let me ask you a question. So most now, of our now, viewers- Let me score up up to sure, sure. don't, don't lose that question. You know, there is potential for still, for the United States and China to, after this is all over, to say, hey, wait a minute. Um, we have just rediscovered the fact that everyone on, on the planet can infect everybody else, regardless of nationality, borders, all of, um, and prejudices and, and, and our sense of competition and distance from one another. Let's do something about this. Let's have a G20 for um, met medicine, for um, pandemics, or let's, let's all work together to strengthen the WHO and, and improve response. Or let's create a, you know, in past shocks, you've had strategic petroleum reserves um, set up all over the world to deal with the fact that, that back in the 70s, one of the biggest ex external shocks was the Middle East deciding that they didn't want to give um, the rest of the world oil. Um, maybe we need a strategic ventilator reserve. And that's the kind of thing that, that um, societies could, in fact, get to get their act together um, and talk about and work about it. No, no one, there's not much of that going on right now, and it may be a little bit late um, for on the prevention side of this crisis. But but one could think that that would be possible. And there, and there is in fact very little in um, at, aside from human nature, there is not much or any reason for people to compete in the sphere of epidemic pre prevention and and preparedness. Right, it's by nature a cooperation issue. The the you know the theorists around U.S.-China relations are constantly grasping at climate change as the example of why the U.S. and China must get along because we need to cooperate in response to climate change. I've always been a bit skeptical of that because the fact of the matter is all of the actions on on climate change are by nature local and have an economic cost. So there is a tragedy of the commons, which takes place as each, each society says, well, you, it's your fault that you're producing too much carbon. Um, there's, and so they're actually, you know, it's not really a cooperative conversation on climate change. Um, but on this, where people are infecting one another, it, it is by nature that way. And, and one could hope that you'd see some of that. Sorry to go on on that, but it's one of my hobby horses. You, okay. had, a, you had a good question. Yeah, so uh, a question from, from one of the viewers. Please comment on the extent to which this pandemic will accelerate reshoring and how fast? Uh, some, uh, but not, and uh, in, in perhaps in specific sectors, like getting back to the, the international or the ventilator reserve, strategic ventilator reserve, perhaps societies will say, well, there's some stuff here that we need to make locally because we can't be sure about getting it um, in, in, uh, in international commerce. Um, and, and also investment decisions made locally because people haven't traveled. Um, but I think the incentive for companies, as long as they're not being disincentivized by things like tariffs and investment restrictions, the incentive for companies to continue to invest and trade across borders is gonna be very, very, very strong. Um, and the, uh, and an epidemic, a global epidemic per se, doesn't change the long-term calculus of that. Okay, so just a few more questions. We just have a few more minutes here. 
Um, Justin Trudeau says he's closing the Canadian border to non-U.S. citizens. What effect will this have on you on the U.S. and for how long? Um, I guess non-U.S. citizens won't be able to go to Canada. Um, <laughs> uh, not not a bit very big impact, I don't think, because most of the people traveling back and forth between the U.S. and Canada are can Americans and Canadians. Okay, so last question, I think. Um, you, you know Asia well, you know the US well, and you know the economy well, and, and trade patterns and so forth. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about media coverage of this pandemic and the pandemic itself and the economic fallout from it. All of our, most of our viewers are in the journalism business and the news business. Um, so do you have a perspective on how well you think the, the pandemic and the related economic issues are being covered in general and, and how well they're being covered in, in the US versus being covered in, in Asia, China specifically, or other locales? Sure. Um, I think generally speaking, the global journalism community has been pretty quick to realize the importance of this issue and, um, and has been driving the conversation about the importance of it um, as well as reacting to it. And that most, and I, I sense in much media reporting um, through reputable outlets, uh, a sense of responsibility about checking facts and not being too much gotcha headline-ish. Um, there is a tendency to want to be, you know, like, you know, you get stuff like Tom Hanks has coronavirus. Okay. So, we all like Tom Hanks, good actor, so people want to know that. Um, and it, and so, you know, it's going to get reported, even though it, it's not a material fact. And Tom Hanks's infection of coronavirus is as important as, you know, anonymous Jane, Jane John Doe person in Australia's infection, right? Um, but, uh, and you get, you'll, there's been some sensationalism and, and exciting stuff. The online, um, stuff is is pretty awful a lot of it is is crazy and people manufacture um fake news for some reason it's kind of an evil thing to do um uh and that happens in every place i think one of the challenges the china story was not well reported um because of the restrictions on on reporting in china and the language barrier leading to um a um, not a clear sense of what was actually going on there, and and so uh, and I think the the distrust of China and the fact that it it has all the restrictions that it has on foreign journalism um, led to uh, misunderstandings and even more suspicion about what was taking place in China. So I found myself like the other the other day yesterday I watched this half hour video by GCTN state owned, right? Lots of happy music about success in Wuhan, but actually kind of useful to watch because it showed some of the methodologies that were being used and, and accurately reported some of the dire circumstances that people have been, been living with in Wuhan. And I found it useful to watch because it helped get one mentally prepared for what could happen in the United States, which won't be the same as China because it's a different society, but it helps give a sense of scale um, and also the fact that people did continue to eat and live, and even though it was terribly inconvenient and and, and miserable. So that that kind of of my point being that there's been um, pretty good, but I think that that journalists should continue to focus on providing insights as well as facts, um, and really um, helping people. Uh, understand how to deal with the situation, as well as get their eyeballs on on, on shiny objects. And uh, I'd, I'd give the overall U.S. journalist community a, a solid B minus. Um, B minus? Yeah. Okay. On average. B minus. Yeah. All right. I don't think it's been disastrous, but 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 it has it has been an exercise for persons like myself to sift through. Um, some of the blasty headlines to actually find pieces which were um, useful and insightful and, and informative. 